So here are some slice disks. You've already seen at least one of these, at least in the exercises in the far left. Uh, we have two different slice disks divided by 946. Um, at the end of yesterday's lecture, we were uh, starting to sketch a proof that quantum homology distinguishes these different slice disks. And I should point out that these were first, um, I'm going to write down some miscellaneous things here. Um, Sundberg and Swan uh, in 2021 first distinguished slice disks for 946. Um, so maybe I'll read it. Uh, the maximum quantum homology for D not in D1. Um, read each of these disks bounded by 946. Uh, that would be the principle not 3 minus 3, 3. Here, I'm actually looking at the mirror. And why is that? Well, their original argument is to say if these two uh, maps are intended to be different, or we believe that they're different, then what you want to do is look at them as maps from quantum uh, homology of the empty link to quantum homology of 946. And so if you just want to just distinguish maps like this, all you need to do is look where the image of one goes, and that's going to give you some element that they're going to call the relative kavanov jacobson class. Okay. But the point is, to each one of these disks, there's just a natural invariant sitting inside of the quantum homology, which is the image of the generator of the quantum homology that you set under that map. Okay. So if these disks are different, then the point is that you could look, another way to, re to reframe this is to say, if I look at the element delta, which is the difference of this, uh, then that element is non-trivial. Okay? And so uh, this is sort of algorithmic. You calculate the induced map, you look at these elements, you look at their difference, and now you have some element quantum homology you need to determine, is it non-zero or not? Okay? Um, so uh, in that case, they're able to show that it's non-zero. Mm -hmm. The approach that we started sketching yesterday uh, was to instead work backwards. And now sort of abstractly under the duality isomorphism we talked about, looking at a map one way versus taking its mirrored reverse the other way, those should contain the same uh, information essentially, um, especially for example, over a, uh, over a field. And so the idea in the sort of, well, I should say, uh, later that year work of, myself and, and Isaac, uh, the idea was just to start trying to sort of take educated guesses on some elements of homology and then look at the map going in reverse. So instead, there the perspective is to work from KH of the mirror, 946, I'll write minus 946. To Z. Or in our case, for convenience, we work by like mapping to Z2. Um, but it's a little bit of a deal with the devil because, on the one hand, it's easier to calculate the image of one element under a map uh, that just goes from a sort of uh, lovely simple knot down to the empty set than it is to have to turn around and distinguish whether an arbitrary element of homology is non zero or not. But then you have to have some tools for trying to make these guesses about what classes might distinguish surfaces. Okay. So I, I, I indicated a bit about this during the questions at the end of yesterday's lecture. Um, and so I just want to give a rough sense here. We can see that these disks are sort of determined by band moves. And we said that on in one case, we want a, well, we want a, a cycle in quantum homology. Here, the light gray arcs are the zero resolution arcs. So it's sort of a useful lemma that if you're trying to write down a cycle in quantum homology, we should write this, mention this. Um, alpha in, if you can write it this way. A labeled smoothing in CKH. Uh, the cycle, if and only if every zero resolution 
are joins two distinct X labeled smoothing components. Okay, this is yeah. You know, we're still working with sort of the standard flavor of homology for this statement, and uh, so that's true here. We can see that the, the gray arcs are always joining distinct components and X labeled components. And on top of that, if we do a band move right here, the effect on the smoothing will be to merge two distinct X labeled circles. And so we know M X times X goes to zero. Uh, on the other hand, we started to sketch the argument that if you do the pinch move on the left, then the movie for this, you convert it into the element of quartisms. You can check and track through that this maps that element uh, to plus or minus one. Okay. We're going to do a more detailed calculation in a moment. Um, for, for practice, for anybody who uh, didn't get a chance to really practice that yesterday. But I want to point out there's lots of examples like this. Uh, this example on the right, this is the knot, I think 15 and 103, 488. Um, you guys know it by heart uh, for sure. Um, but similar thing, here we have, I want to point out both of these are situations where we have one disk routed by some knot, and that knot has a strong involution. We apply that to the uh, to the disk, and because the involution, at least sort of apparently, perhaps I stop it extends, but at least visually, we see that it doesn't extend over the disk, and so we're getting two different disks, at least two candidates for different disks, bounded by the fixed knot. Here, the involution, the other one goes like this, and um, let's see. And so uh, there again, we can make a nice educated guess about what this should look like. Um, there's not, so currently uh, I'll say a bit more later, but there's not some kind of perfect algorithm for uh, producing classes that do distinguish these maps. Um, but there are some rules of thumb. For one thing, we said we want for if, if a class is supposed to die under some cobordism, then you want saddle moves in that cobordism to join distinct X labeled components. So here, for example, this band move joins two distinct X labeled components of the smoothing. Um, I should also mention, I forgot to say, these, these slides are also posted to my site as with the first lecture slides. Okay. Um, and, and what other types of properties can we start to try to gather? Uh, I'm not going to by the writing these sort of in words on the board because they are heuristics, not sort of uh, you know algorithmic techniques. But it's good over here that the band for the other disk is splitting an X labeled circle because you know splitting an X labeled circle just splits into two X labeled circles. Um, and you might also see some other sort of aesthetic similarities between the cycles and the actual disks that they're corresponding to. That is. Here, for example, there's this nice long smoothing that is sort of reminiscent of the, uh, the ciphered circle that you get by resolving the corners of this band. Okay. Um, there's these two larger uh, smoothing circles that seem reminiscent of the larger sheets, those zero handles in the surface up top. Okay. So generally speaking, um, I have time to say this. One sort of useful starting point for producing such classes um, Often useful uh, to start with the oriented resolution. So that is, if I have positive crossing like this, then I want to go that with the zero resolution. If I have a negative crossing, here, well, maybe I should have gone the other way to make it more visually interesting. The point is that's still going to be that, except now that's going to be a one resolution. Okay. 
Um, but then you need to choose your labels, right? And then attempt to Uh, so I should have said, this will guarantee that you're in the correct uh, homological grading. The page grading, because we want it to be in homological grading zero, because uh, if we're mapping to, for example, an empty set, that's it's homology is supported in homological grading zero. So then we want to have to choose labels um, to make Q equal to negative the Euler characteristic of the surface. That way, when you actually apply the map, you get a grading shift by the Euler characteristic, and so you map into quantum grading zero. Okay. And often you can't achieve this on the nose. Um, well, actually, there's, there's two problems. Oh, question. Um, I'm a little confused about the homological grading zero bit. I thought that saddles, like because they're part of the differential, would like change the homological grading. But I feel like we, if I'm understanding your remark correctly, which I also might not be, it seems like we're using the fact that was sort of cited on the problem session that all the elementary quartisms preserve homological grading. Yeah, yeah. It's a, okay, great question. So just to repeat at least part of the core question, like, on the one hand, talking about saddles, perhaps preserving the, for example, a homological grading, yet saddles are precisely what are used to define the arrows in the cube of resolution and therefore the boundary map. So there should be shifting the homological grading if it's truly the homological grading. And the point is, that's absolutely true. However, the when we think about sort of what the saddles are at the cube of resolution, they're also really, uh, what's the right way to put this? Um, The, uh, oh, sorry, let me just make sure I'm going to say this right. Yeah, okay. So it, the, I think in, in one sense, the simplest way I could say is that there's a difference because there you're really talking about resolving actual crossings. And so in general, uh, if we have a, um, i trying to get the right way to put this. So I'm, I'm blanking on the way to sort of close the loop in the statement. Um, but the, uh, yeah, I mean, I must have switched up because now I'm thinking of the difference between actually getting rid of a crossing. Let, let me maybe try it not to, because I, I thought I was about to answer a different question actually, then, then what is your question? So okay. yeah, let, let me say that it should be consistent. So maybe we, we, we should revisit it afterwards before I step into quicksand. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, uh, but right. So how do we see that this does have the correct homological grading? Just for starters there. Well, the point is that at positive crossings, you have zero resolutions. At negative crossings, you have one resolution. So your number of one resolutions is exactly your number of negative crossings. So that's guaranteeing that the homological grading is zero. Um, and then uh, here, typically what happens if you attempt to try to write down some cycle directly, uh, or some elements in the correct quantum grading directly. Well, it's a good little exercise to figure out what exactly this quantum grading is going to be if you do the oriented resolution, because um, it might not be the right quantum grading. Uh, you'll often have too many circles in your smoothing. It's sort of one way to think about it. Um, and in this in this situation, uh, if you can't. standard trick is to try flipping the oriented to disoriented resolution um, in specific places. We, we'll, we'll put this to work in a moment. Um, to disoriented resolutions at pairs of crossings that are canceled uh, by R2 moves in the movie. 
Okay. Um, why is why is that? Well, one thing if you're flipping pairs, that's definitely to keep it in the correct homological grading because you know maybe you, you're trading a zero uh, and a one here and here. You're automatically going to have things canceling with the, with the plus and a minus. Um, so if we do this, let's say uh, naively for nine forty six. Okay. Um, I'm going to do the annoying thing of starting to change the diagram just in C2. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to keep redrawing it. But uh, let's start with the all oriented resolution. So if we checked, that would mean these go like this. Well, I should say all of these columns just become little collections. Islands. If you stare at the diagram to track around arrows, you'll see this is the correct one. Okay. But for one thing, and we'll talk about, we already addressed symmetry in one context, we'll talk about symmetry more in a little bit. But this cycle definitely, not cycle, sorry, this smoothing, uh, the only way it could potentially be used to distinguish some surface, like if some label labeling on it could be used to distinguish these surfaces, then it would have to be that the labels are at least eight asymmetrically distributed, because if the labels are also symmetric, this should behave the same under the two cobordism maps, because the cobordisms are themselves defined by that symmetry, or the difference between them defined by that symmetry. So we do want something that's going to be asymmetric. Um, you know, if we just stare at this, there actually is, if I draw in some, uh, using the sort of convention I've been using, which is zero resolution arcs as red arcs, And one resolution arcs as blue arcs. That's probably not very visible, sorry about that. But the point is outsides are zero, insides are, are one, because the outsides are uh, positive properties and the inside are negative. One cycle you could write down to end up in the correct bi-grading is this element. Um, normally, you know, we're trying to use that lemma we were writing down before. How do we check that something's a cycle? Zero resolution arcs have to join distinct X label components. And that's easy to check here. And then these two components, circle components, they only have one resolution arcs adjacent to them. So those are sort of relatively free. We can kind of put any labels on them, and it's not going to affect whether it's a cycle or not, because there's no differential mapping out of those uh, those sort of those crossings. Okay. But of course, this falls into the trap we were just talking about. This is symmetric. So this is not going to distinguish, it's not going to behave differently under cobordisms that are related by that symmetry. Okay. Um, however, side so note, you can check if you want as a little exercise. This will map to something non zero under both of those. In fact, um, you can argue that if you set this up as um, a braid, I'm not saying it's, it's very evident, but you can actually show that this is essentially Pomodoskis invariant, or it's the image of Pomodoskis invariant. Uh, under a certain isopy that takes uh, quality positive braid for 946 to the pretzel diagram. Okay. And so this is not going to have the right behavior. So we try to make it asymmetric. And we can use that same trick. We can try to flip pairs of, of oriented resolution crossings that would be canceled by, our, by Mr. Two moves. So, for example, if we're, if we're doing a band move here, then these two crossings will be paired off and canceled by a Reinmeister two move. I hope, that, I hope that that's sort of visually clear. If I pinch here, then I just pull this little tongue out under there. So I could try to change this and this crossing. Let me get rid of these labels now. So now this becomes a zero, this becomes a one. And oh, bad news, this is definitely not a cycle because I have a zero resolution arc with both its ends on the same component. So let me keep doing this. Let me change these.
If I change all of those, then now I could put an X label on here. And uh, that's sort of, I can't put a one label on there and hope to get a cycle. I mean, for one thing, we could be, we could be aiming for elements of the, of the chain uh, complex that are sums of multiple labeled smoothings. But, but if we're trying to be sort of efficient, we might hope that we can do it with a single labeled smoothing. Um, so the only way that this could be a cycle would be if this is X labeled. And if we check, actually, this, this will be a cycle. And this is precisely the cycle that we wrote down. It's precisely the one that's right there. So um, you know, under the movie, what happens? We do a saddle on the left. We get this. It splits. This is like a tower of Reitermeister ones that get undone. And we know that the Reitermeister one map will just take this component and send x to one. And so it'll go away. Look at this. And you do the same thing down here. Reitermeister ones. And then finally, what's going on here? Actually, diagrammatically, if we fill it back in. We have this, but this is just two unlinks linked together. And it's easy to check that if we do a master two move here. This is in our tables, if you recall the tables from the exercises yesterday. This uh, this smoothing under the Rainmaster 2 is just the identity map. So when I do a Rainmaster 2 to flip these, it just has the effect of preserving the smoothing visually, but getting rid of the crossings. And you continue to do that, and you get down to just two uh, X labeled circles. The diagram itself is on the crossings. You cap those off with disks and maps it to one. Okay. okay. So that was a sort of trying to walk through in a bit more detail um, an example of given a pair of surfaces trying to find some element in cohomology that distinguishes them. So I'm pause to see if there are questions. Um, I know it was sort of a mix of, of sketch and detail, uh, but I just want to see if there's any questions about any of that discussion so far. Yeah. Is it, is it worth the trouble of going through all these quadricate guesses instead of just do the dual and start with one in the empty set? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. The problem is that with, with the other approach, the, the complexity grows enormously quickly. Um, you, you know, it's, it's exponential because the, the way to think about it is, sure, a, a, a Reitermeister move, depending on the sort of handedness, maybe that adds one, um, like, uh, if I have some, some element and I apply Reitermeister one move to the actual knot, typically that's gonna preserve the number of chains that are being used to express that element. But if I start doing Reitermeister two, those will start doubling the number of uh, component of, uh, of generators in the expression of your chain. So for every Reitermeister two, sort of roughly speaking, you'll start doubling. And so you quickly get into the, you know, hundreds, thousands, you know, millions pretty quickly uh, in theory. I mean, maybe there could be some cancellation, but the, the, the point is that uh, the computation of complexity grows really fast in the other direction. But isn't this like the essence of this word, well educated guess, just kind of like backtracing to, uh, sorry, let's say a number of ones in the yeah. homology of unknots and try to see that as the image of some cycle. But then each randomizer two move will, let's say, the wrong randomizer one move will also create two different two things or label two things. So essentially, what you're doing is just guessing the same complexity of things in your head instead of writing. So, so the answer is that, like, that is sort of, the, oh, let, me, let me quick answer and then, then re-explain the, the question to make sure it's clear. Um, the, the, the brief answer is you can try to, to sort of take a sort of backtracing, sort of guessing what the pre-image of the generator is, um, but that's sort of decidedly not what, for example, I'm sketching in this heuristic for how to find uh, candidates. 
Uh, so far, what we said is like, here's how to get things that are sort of algebraically correct in terms of the phi grading and everything. We said that the geometry or the sort of the diagrammatic properties will also provide some indication in terms of like, you want certain bands to merge or split certain circles, et cetera. Those are typically really what's what's guiding this sort of ad hoc process. You can absolutely try to backtrace. So just to clarify, one way to think about this is as soon as I do my first band move, in this case, this is only requires one band per disk. That means I now, after this band, have an unlink. It's a weird looking diagram of an unlink, but the unlink you know, has relatively simple cohomology, and I know which element of the cohomology of the unlink I need to hit, because uh, it needs to be the one which is going to survive when I cap off the unlink. And so I can try to just actually write down what that element is right before my band, and then just try to pull one of those elements back into an element of the topology of the actual knot, um, which you could do, but that, that shares the same issue because of computational complexity as just map, doing the map forward to begin with. Okay, so I want to uh, quickly go through um, another couple of examples and then um, slides away and we'll get before we wrap. So other questions about this discussion, these calculations in this space, uh, basic case on the left. So um, another thing I want to point out is that uh, it's helpful here that these knots are symmetric and we can sort of leverage the symmetry to help guide our understanding of what's going to be happening with these cohortism maps. Um, uh, when we start to talk about not floor homology in particular, but even actually level of quantum homology, um, you can more explicitly try to ask, well, okay, the fact that the disks will become, will be proven non isotopic real boundary by cohomology, that shows that the boundary symmetry does not extend over the, either of the disks. But you can actually ask something stronger. You could ask, is there, for example, any slice disk for 946 over which that, uh, that symmetry extends? So this becomes sort of like an equivariant slice genus problem. And in particular, if you could show that the sort of equivariant slice genus is greater than zero, that would immediately confirm that the pair of disks are different because uh, if, they, if they were the same, then that would be, uh, sorry, okay, I, I lost the third of logic where I was in sentence. The point was that if the equivariant slice genus was greater than zero, um, then there cannot be a, uh, a, a isotopy relating one disk to the other because then it would be the equivariant, or at least isotopy equivariant, an isotopy equivariant slice disk. Okay. Um, so that strategy was taken up effectively in the not floor setting uh, by Dime out and stop again, and also some recent work of uh, Keita Asano um, that I think you'll hear about on Tuesday uh, does the, the same type of argument in the, uh, in the Kibonim setting. Okay. So um, what I want to do now quickly is sketch a proof of something that was brought up last time. So on the, in the exercises, you already had a, a chance to take a crack at proving that Kibana homology can detect some exotic surfaces. So we'll say that sigma and sigma prime in B4, Exotically knotted. And here we'll at least say rel boundary. If they're C0 uh, isotopic rel boundary, but they're not smoothly isotopic rel boundary. Um, and so there was an example a pair of cyphered surfaces for the whitehead double the trap oil on the homework, on the homework, on the exercises, uh, where you at least proved that they were not smoothly isotopic rel boundary. Um, and then there was a, a remark pointing out that you can use work of Tommy and Powell to show that they are topologically isotopic rel boundary. Uh, but those were the first examples. Um, So the first examples were pairs of slice disks. 
Now I should say these, the slice disks I was going to point out were not uh, first distinguished using cosmology. Those are these slice disks here, um, but they were the first sort of exotic surfaces distinguished by cosmology. Um, so this is a, um, a paper with Isaac Thunberg, one. Um, and so I just want to, as an example of, uh, again, seeing the flavor of these calculations, quickly walk through. So here we have these two different disks. Um, we can find pairs of cycles using the same construction, same heuristic as before. If you actually start with the label smoothing, just like in the 946 case, and then start to try to break the symmetry while getting the correct quantum grading and preserving the fact that, for example, a band move here better split an X labeled smoothing. Um, and conversely, uh, the other one drawn, yeah, conversely, if I did a, a band right here, that would be killing that cycle. So, um, oh, okay, I guess this is. So, Unnecessary, but fun. Just looking at the movie, we see all the different randomized moves that are going to have to be factored in, and then we go to actually calculate the the images of these classes. And we're not going to go through the full thing, but I wanted to include these, especially as examples that are linked on the site, because they sort of contain sort of the full decorations that will help be helpful to understanding the maps. Um, so just for beginner, the, just for starters, if we're going to do the comportism that starts with the saddle on the left, here we're going to split this X labeled circle. So we had a split map. We're going to put these into X and X. Here, zero and one resolution arcs are all uh, labeled. And so I'm just going to go through the first couple of steps. But here, what's the next move? We're going to do a red right two of pulling that top bit underneath the strand. And again, here, this is corresponding to the, uh, the smoothing, which the photos map acts as the identity. Um, and so all you really see is these crossings go away and the thing pulls pull back. Then we do Reinmeister 1, and that has the effect of supplying the depth map to this component and giving it the crossing. And we'll see a bunch more of these Reinmeister 2s that are just the identity map on the, on the level of the labeled smoothing. And um, it's not until, so the main point I want to show is, it's not until we get over here, when you're going to pull this back, this is the first time that you see one of the resolutions of an R2 move that has the little island in the middle. Um, but in that case, what we see is that the map is going to apply the depth map to that component, and then attach a saddle across the arch where that component used to sit. And because that was a single x component, that just splits this into, again, a big x component and a small one. Okay. So I'm walking through that quickly only because I just want people to, to uh, know there are some examples that in practice sort of reading off exactly how these maps work for practice. Okay, so, um, so let me go ahead and keep going now. Right, well, again, not that I went through the full thing, but are there any questions about sort of what I'm explaining in terms of how to read and reproduce these types of calculations. You, you need to use these, the, the definitions of comportive maps, um, but one can sort of just plug and chug once you have the, the cycle. Okay, so another couple of comments before we move away from the slides. Um, actually, you know, we may end up staying on the, on the slides the, the whole time, we'll see. Um, here's an example of a uh, the Steven or not, which from this picture on the left, it's kind of hard to see the uh, to see the slice disk. However, as you know, it was on the first set of problems, you can rearrange it to draw a, a diagram where you can see a ribbon immersed surface. Uh, and it turns out you can distinguish these surfaces monophology over integral coefficients, but not over Zima two coefficients. And um, the it sort of it's, it seems although. It, don't know a sort of perfectly satisfying explanation. This seems related to the fact that the uh, all the prior examples we were looking at naturally arise as uh, quasi-positive braided surfaces if we put them into that form. We'll mention that in a moment. 
and they have this strong inversion that flips the uh, flips the, the actual ribbon inverse diagram to the disk. This has different properties, and it indeed shows up in the way it's distinguished. Um, okay, and then uh, oh, so I meant to say, I guess I'll just say this. However, um, more probably doesn't distinguish. Um, for example, the infinite <laughs> collection of puncture tori uh, found by Gomp found to the not. 12 and 141, I believe. Um, so this is a, sort of a schematic of the surfaces that, that Bob found. Uh, you know, lurking behind this story uh, for a lot of these surfaces is that if you take the branch covers of the four ball over them, you get some four manifolds. And for all of the, uh, all the slices I've been showing before, those branch covers, those four manifolds admit some, some symmetry of the boundary that fails to extend over the four manifold. And that's perfectly paralleling the fact that the knot bounds these surfaces that some symmetry doesn't extend over. This is slightly different. This is gonna have, its branch cover is gonna have some infinite order symmetry in the boundary. Its branch co double cover four ball is the Gomp nucleus. And so uh, what is going on in the construction of these surfaces, what was it at the very end? Oh, um, I'm going to jump forward and then back for a second. Yeah, what's going on in the construction of these surfaces uh, was alluded to in the first lecture, which is there's this pair of twist boxes, which if I look at the surface, they look fairly enmeshed. But if I just only look at the knot itself, and it's hard to see. Oh, it's actually not showing up at all. Uh, this there should be shaded in from here all the way over up to the top and then winding through that sort of tunnel of twisting crossings, there's actually essentially um, a, uh, oh, what do I want to say? There's an arc that goes straight from here through there. And if you unroll along that entire arc, so for example, you're gonna end up flipping this entire clasp, et cetera, you do that, you can cancel crossings here and here. And that will extend over the knot, but not over the surfaces. So if I start with zero in here, then this just looks like some band joining this top sheet to this bottom sheet. But as soon as I start to roll, uh, I'm going to pick up lots of inter ribbon intersections between that band and the sheets. Okay. And so these uh, the branch covers of these, we said are these stomp nuclei, and uh, you can use some written variants to show, for example, that um, the, uh, the associated symmetry of the boundary does not extend over the, the four manifold. Okay. Um, however, uh, it turns out that topology does not distinguish these. And the easiest way to show that is to show that these are in fact all quasi-positive braided surfaces. So I believe that uh, Mark talked about braided surfaces uh, a bit yesterday. And on the exercises, there were the discussion of Arnesco's invariant and quasi positive braids. Um, so I'll say another word about that um, in a moment. But before I move on to that, I want to pause to see if there's questions about this, um, what these surfaces are. Okay. So um, the See, do I want to, okay, I'll, maybe I'll finish the discussion of these real quick. The point is that here, this is going to use the fact that KH in bigrading zero, uh, let's see, I want this to be minus one. Okay, so the, the other characteristic of a puncture torus is going to be minus one. And if I look at quantum homology and bigrading zero one of this knot,
It's rank one. So there's only one copy's worth of Z that this coordinate maps from here to the empty set are going to be supported in. And so, for example, if we can show that, uh, if we can find a generator of this and argue that that generator is the same thing under all those surfaces, then we'll be good. And the strategy is to show that, in fact, there's a braid representation of this knot where Palmanesca's invariant is non-zero and generates uh, generates the quantum homology. And what we'll see, um, or at least allude to in a moment, is that if you have a quasi-positive braided surface, actually this, I guess, was on the on the exercise yesterday, it always sends Palmanesca's invariant uh, to plus or minus one. Um, so in fact, all of these surfaces are going to end up mapping Palmanesca's invariant for that one braid representative to one. So part of the reason why I want to mention this is that this is another style of useful argument, which is because we can, by computer, calculate quantum homology quite well, you can start to pair a sort of abstract calculation where we don't know what this element is, but we know how many linearly independent elements there could even be in that bi-grading, and pair that with an explicit construction on the other side of a cycle, in that case, Palmanesca's invariant, and trying to play the computability off of the um, ability to find explicit cycles. Okay. Um, so in that in that direction, um, and by the way, I'm, since we started late, it, you know, it's okay. Keep, yeah, all right. So, um, okay, so before I move away from the slides, let's spend a, a moment more talking about braided surfaces, because the braided surfaces in particular. Um, so uh, let me, Call from the exercises, or if you haven't seen it, recall from right this moment um, that a braid uh, beta in the n-stranded braid group is quasi-positive if it's a product of products uh, product of the conjugates of the standard positive Barton generators. Um, so, for example, uh, this knot that surrounds these disks, it, it's quasi positive. And for example, one quasi positive factorization of it is given by the braid, which is bounded by this surface, or the, which, yeah, which is the surface, which is bounded by the surface. Um, but what do you see? You see for each one of these ribbon bands that it sort of follows along some path winding over and under strands, has a positive crossing and then does the opposite. And so that's exactly giving rise to the product of conjugates of positive uh, generators. And from the exercises, uh, showed that there's an element psi in the quantum homology of the closure of beta, which I'll write as beta hat, and it's in migrating zero uh, right of beta minus n, where n is the braid index, w is the right. Such that the uh, the braided surface defined by the QP braid word uh, maps psi to plus or minus one. So this gives a type of non-vanishing result for any surface that's obtained as a, uh, a braided surface associated to a quasi-positive braided factorization. Okay. And so you might hope that maybe that can help us distinguish surfaces. Um, so for example, the knot 10, 148, it bounds two different positively braided surfaces. And so we might ask, well, can we look at Palmanosca's invariant? And so I'll try to uh, distinguish these. So here are these two different quasi-positive braid factorizations of the boundary. And now the problem is that uh, polymorphism is invariant. It's useful in that it behaves nicely under these homomorphisms. Problem is that it behaves too nicely. 
the the fact is that the the argument that shows that Polish could marry natural plus minus one doesn't actually know about the braid word itself or really about the, the factorization in particular, right? It just resolves it into a braid-like fashion. And so it's going to behave the same under both of these maps. If I look at this, this is polymorphism variance, so all braided smoothing with uh, the, the, the braided smoothing with all X labels. The argument from the exercises yesterday shows that it maps to plus or minus one. So this is not going to help us distinguish surfaces. On the other hand, um, here's something which I'll call a uh, an example conjecture, um, which is that the monophomology contains an invariant of uh, Graded surfaces that um, oh sorry a graded graded surfaces associated to uh, band factorizations so when I say band factorization I mean a product. Conjugates of the standard generators. In theory, you could do plus or minus on the middle. And um, only a theory example conjecture because, well, in the narrowest sense, this is true. Polymanovsky's invariant is exactly such a thing. It's a braid invariant. And so uh, it's going to be also a invariant of the um, braid factorization. That doesn't mean it is any good at distinguishing different braid factorizations you know, via the surfaces they define, however. Um, and so the what the sort of example slash conjecture part about it is asking if we have an invariant that's actually sensitive. Okay. Um, so, for example, a natural thing to do is mimic the construction of Pomanovsky's invariant. Maybe we call this like a Pomanovsky's kind of invariant. Um, what we're going to do is that all of the crossings that come from conjugates, that's sort of most of the crossings, uh, you know, we have the core standard positive generators, and then the things they're conjugated by. At the core, the core generators still do what Pomanovsky does, make it oriented in the braid-like way. But then at the conjugating, conjugating crossings, take the disoriented resolution. And what's the point of doing this? Well, now the, it's a sort of an exercise if you want, such elements, regardless of the um, labels put on those, we can see in the, the get-go that under, under the cohorts of maps, you'll see resolutions at the positive crossings. And then all of the disoriented resolutions will still cancel off in pairs under right of my sort of two moves. Uh, and if you can find, and there's sort of some heuristics for how to choose your labels, but if you can choose your labels such that it uh, maps to, uh, you can choose your labels such that it maps to one under the, Braided cobordism. And why is this sensitive to the, to the band factorization? Well, if I try to resolve at a band that's not one of those positive crossings, then you can argue it's an exercise that that's going to be uh, always inducing a trivial map if you try to resolve with a, a twisted band at one of the disoriented resolutions. So, um, sorry, we'll go through this sort of informally again because this is not sort of algorithmic. Um, but you can mimic her construction and guess that's sensitive to band factorizations. And indeed, if we check, this is a cycle. Um, and let me move past this. And now if we check, this actually does see the difference between these surfaces. So in the top, it'll map to one. That's the surface that it was sort of built to mirror. On the other hand, if we map it forward under this other resolute, this other surface, uh, which the other surface corresponds to some band move at a conjugating crossing instead of a core crossing, a map to zero. Okay, so, um, so what do I want to say here? Uh, okay, so just to okay, so to, to wrap up the the two very last things I want to say are you can actually apply this to our desired examples. Um, the the problem is that the naive construction that I just sketched 
it doesn't necessarily give you a cycle. It might have boundary. It does what you want in terms of the right behavior out of the comportism maps, but it's not always a cycle. And so the strategy, which is often possible here, and also, also sometimes possible in other contexts, is to find some extra sort of, uh, sort of fixing terms, which don't change the behavior on the quartism map or in the kernel of the quartism map and in the kernel of the different quartism map you want to compare to, and they kill off the boundary. And so, for example, that's possible here. Um, and uh, if, if someone's curious, I do think that trying to think about how to exactly associate actual cycles to band factorizations is an interesting problem. Um, and uh, let's see if I have a second. If I can find a, a way. Okay, yeah. So you know what? I think that I don't know exactly what time uh, we started, but let me, you know, okay. So let me build this one for a second. All right. So the final thing I wanted to get today is me a quick right turn because this is going to be our segue towards not floor homology. So I just want to mention something which was on the exercises and which uh, is a sort of a broadening. So that was a bit of a, of a survey of what techniques we have for distinguishing maps using Kibana homology. But you sort of run out of juice in the standard theory when you try to apply it to certain problems. So for example, we said that at least over Z2, if I have a surface that has been stabilized, actually, stabilized with a, by connect summing it with a local copy of T2, so this factored into the, the, one of the exercises about distinguishing a pair of cyphered surfaces. But in general, it's not true that surfaces always become isotopic just because you stabilize them, like next one with, with uh, T2. And so if we instead, we said that you could consider other Frobenius algebras. In general, we can, uh, just to copy that something from the exercises from yesterday, if we instead work with Barnaton homology, it's going to have essentially the same setup, but it's going to be, for our purposes, over Z2 adjoints some variable. And there, uh, the, the previous house would be the same, except for two changes, which is that X times X no longer dies. It's H times X. And the split map for one is one tensor X plus X tensor one minus, I also over Z2 minus the same as plus, but in case one were to over Z, I'm gonna write it as minus just in case. One tensor one. Okay. And one of the exercises shows that for the analogous problem, uh, let me just write it this way. If I stabilize, then I just get H times the map induced by sigma. And so, um, this idea of, in general, using torsion by working, uh, but, well, I can have it in which there's torsion. Using these, these rings and these structures that allow for extra variables is something that was observed to uh, be effective in quantum homology for two types of problems. For one, distinguishing surfaces that uh, have been stabilized, and also related things for understanding the complexity of the words in terms of the number of critical points that they need to have. Um, and so while those techniques are available and powerful inside of quantum homology, they're even more accessible inside of not floor homology. And so starting next time, we'll start to see that uh, some of the algebraic tools that are available on the not floor side are even more adept at uh, detecting more refined features, things like this. Okay, so I'm running over. Uh, thank you guys. Yeah. Could you 
you say a bit more about trying to find this sort of uh, correction, this correction term that you're adding to produce something that's yeah. actually a class? Yeah, definitely. So, um, looking for the, where the, where the problematic costing is. Okay, so I think. It is. Um, okay, so I think that it's on this component. If we look, um, that's the one that corresponds to taking the oriented resolution of like the conjugated art integrator, right? Well, so what, what is that? Sorry, the, the one on the left is the one that's yes, imitating that, that's, that's right. So okay. this one on the left is the the, the one on the right is like this correction term that, you're adding to produce a cycle. That's right. Cool. So the 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 point here is that. Uh, I, I lied a little bit. You actually, you don't need to, to change Plumbo's construction at every single uh, crossing. It suffices to do it at sort of enough of the crossings that you're just not no longer making it so you behave so uniformly under any quasi-positive cohortism. So down here on the bottom, I actually haven't done what I said I would do with those crossings. Now, that's gonna have the consequence of, for example, this right here is gonna be, this is a zero resolution, but it's, has both its ends on this smoothing circle. Now, even if I did do the sort of disoriented oriented sort of modification of Pomodovskis variant at all the crossings, I would still end up finding that it's not a cycle. And so here, the only problem is right here. And so I wanna think, well, if I apply the differential to this element, because it's, I mean, it's not, it's not a cycle, I need to figure out what's in its boundary. This is the only, uh, the only arrow coming out of it. And so, if that becomes a one resolution, then I need to find some other element that's going to kill off the class that I have here, but by replacing this with a zero with a one. Like I need to find some other. Let me see if this is clear. If I have a crossing right here, and this has non-trivial boundary, the boundary map. If these are part of the same, then the boundary map is going to take this to something which looks like. This, but by definition, it's going to change the zero resolution to a one resolution. And so, what I need to do now is find some other element. I don't know, uh, called theta, which also maps to something like this, and it's with its boundary. That way, I can sum my original thing and theta to cancel off. And so, theta better have a one resolution in its boundary here. But if I try to make it have a zero resolution so that has a one resolution there, I'm gonna end up just copying phi. So I need to find some other one resolution in this boundary to change to a zero resolution. So basically you're saying, I have one, el one element, I map it forward by the differential, it's non-zero. I wanna think about what's the pre-image of that element under the boundary map in general, and find some term that's not my class phi. So I wanna find something else that's also mapped to that. And so if you change this zero resolution to one resolution, and now I need to find a different one resolution somewhere in here to change to a zero resolution, you can. Uh, a good candidate turns out to be, where is it? Uh, I, for some reason I can't, I can't see it right now. Um, I think it's above, above the sign of the text. It's, where, it's oh, oh, here? Yes. Yeah, there we go, great. So this was a one resolution, we changed it to a zero resolution, but it turns out to still um, uh, have the only element in its boundary is the one which switches this from zero back to one. And so it, by construction, ends up mapping exactly to the boundary of this. And so there's some cancels it out. However, the point now is that because this is a one resolution, if I try to do a saddle move right there, which is what this cohortism tells you to do, it kills this element. So the, 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 this choice of oriented resolutions at the core crossings and disoriented resolutions at the non-core crossings, sort of, it does all the heavy lifting of making sure that these elements behave the way you want under the cohortism map. Actually, this is not always easy to do. I don't know if, I don't know if it's sort of abstract proof that's always possible even, um, but 
And in practice, even for this rather large parade, it often seems possible. Thank mm -hmm. you. 